Take Five Live on the go. On digital, online, smartphone and tablet. Five Live investigates. Now just have a listen to this. Or how about this? Or maybe you'd prefer this. Not very nice, is it? But at least we can turn it off. Imagine, though, living with that sound in your head all the time. Those are just some of the sounds experienced by the six million in the UK who suffer from tinnitus. But Five Live Investigators have been told that many people are unhappy with the treatment they get from their GP. The British Tinnitus Association surveyed nearly a 1,000 patients. 92% of them said they felt their doctor was dismissive, unsympathetic or simply didn't have enough knowledge of the condition. So today, for the first time, they have published guidance for doctors to help them treat patients effectively. We're going to speak in a moment to Professor Chris Dowrick. He's a GP in Liverpool. Uh, first, though, Isabel Anderson, a musician who lives in Belfast and has suffered from tinnitus for the last five years. Isabel, good morning to you. Hi. So uh, you're a musician, so this must be particularly galling and difficult for you. When did you first become aware that you had tinnitus? It was um, about five years ago, and I got um, really bad wax blocked in my ear and had a really bad ear infection. And while I was kind of waiting for that to clear, I developed tinnitus. Oh, my gosh. And uh, just tell us how it affected your life. Just describe what it's what it feels like. Well... Now it's a lot better and I kind of rarely notice it unless I listen out for it or if I'm in a really quiet room. Um, but when I first got it, it was really, really loud and I found it really difficult to sleep. And um, and it was obviously daunting for me because, like you say, I'm, I'm a musician. So, um, yeah. And can, it was and very... can you just describe kind of, you know, what kind of, what the sound was like, how it was to cope with it? Well, at the beginning, it was incredibly loud and it was kind of like somebody holding a massive battery up to your ear constantly day and night. Um, now it's more like kind of white sound, like white noise. Uh, and, I, and like I say, I don't really notice it during the day unless I'm in a quiet room. So it's changed a lot. Mm. Uh, and did you go to your GP? I did, yeah. And? Um, um, it, well, they weren't particularly helpful. And they didn't refer me to see anyone. And uh, I was just reading the um, new guidelines that the Tinnitus Association have issued for GPs. And, um, you know, one of the one of the things that really struck a chord with me is that to be referred if you're really being affected psychologically, which I was. How badly um, were you affected, would you say? Incredibly badly. Yeah. I, I became suicidal and I didn't hardly sleep for about two months. So um, I definitely kind of probably had a breakdown and I had to go and privately see somebody, even though I was a student at the time and really didn't have much money. I had to go and privately see someone before they really took it seriously. Really? So, yeah, that lack of awareness really then from your GP? Yeah, I think that my GP saw it like I hadn't had it for a very long time. So my the way that I was responding to it wasn't appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah. But it doesn't work like that. And it, you kind of have to think about, because it's so subjective, it's like if somebody walked into a GP office and said, I'm really depressed, so depressed, that I don't know how I'm going to go on. Well, you wouldn't just say, oh, well, people that have depression don't usually get to that point until way down the line, so you're just going to have to deal with it. And it's, yeah. it's kind, of a, kind of a similar thing. Yeah. Uh, Isabel, thank you for that. Let's for uh, Professor Chris Derrick. Chris, is that a familiar story then? It is, I'm afraid, yeah, and I'm, I'm very grateful to, to Isabel for explaining so so clearly and, and, and um, cogently what, what she's gone through. Um, I, I, I should say that I, I myself am someone who lives with um, tinnitus. Really? I, don't, I yeah. don't suffer from it anymore. I've actually had tinnitus for about, uh, well, more than 10 years, so uh, I, I know exactly what she's going through. So, what, um, I mean, I, I'm not, you know, being disrespectful in any no. way, but tinnitus is a, is a condition, you know, that I'm aware of. It's, it's not a an arcane or a, a, an extremely rare condition, is it? How come GPs aren't aware of it or aren't sensitive to it, as appeared to be the case with Isabel's GP? I, 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 I think it's, 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 it's a very good question. I, I think it's partly because it's... it's although, although it's a condition that um, those of us who have are, are, are very aware of, it's, it's, it's not usually 
a serious or life-threatening problem. And I think it's understandable that many GPs will be focusing in their training or in, in, in their day-to-day work on, on problems that, 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 that are, are considered serious in, in that way. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think the point that Isabel makes is absolutely right is, is, is that certainly in the early stages, I think it's something that can be very, very distressing, uh, very worrying, because you, know, you don't know what's going on, you don't know what's going to happen to you, how it's going to affect your life. If there's, I, if there's something positive to take out absolutely. of this, it's that both you and Isabel say that the situation is not as bad now as it was. I mean, yeah. Two questions occur to me. One is what triggers it, and two is how do you, in inverted commas, cure it? Well, um, those are very good questions, and like many things in medicine, I can't give you a, a wonderful answer to either of them. I mean, the, I mean, the, 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 there are certainly some things that trigger it, like sort of exposure to loud noises, machinery, or or rock music, or, or whatever. But but for, for most of us, including myself, um, the, 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 there's no clear trigger. Uh, and in 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 terms of cure, it's 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 something that other, the, unless it's got a particular reason, you know, to, 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 uh, which which most cases haven't. It's not so much curing as as getting used to it mm. and so you, have to, you do have to kind of learn to manage it yeah so so there's there's new guidelines now for gps how, yes. how are they going to help well i i i think they will help by making gps raising it in gps consciousness so so so, so the more gps are more aware of it so we're we're attuned to it we'll we'll actually listen when patients are talking about it i i, I think i'm absolutely the the position about about referring people uh Sooner rather than later, uh, uh, to, to 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 ear, nose, and throat specialists, but more particularly to to audiologists, who are the people who can give you the most uh, the most guidance uh, and, and have got the most expertise in that. Okay. Uh, and and I think people like the British Tennis Association have got very good, helpful information on on their websites and materials, which I think can be um, uh, beneficial and reassuring to a lot of people. Okay, Chris, thanks for your time, Professor Chris Darrick. Thanks also uh, uh, to Isabel as well. I did.